Welcome, I am Marcela Celi Santos, I am from Colombia and I am here as an RCC Fellow and I will share with you today this work called Inclusive Vitality, Human Being Relationships in the Tropical Countryside. So bees have been close human companions since ancient times. Their honey and products represent natural medicines and have important symbolic meanings across cultures. And they pollinate at least half of the flowering plant species benefiting from animal pollination, having a key role in the perpetuation of complex ecosystems, as well as in human food production, helping produce at least 35% of what we consume. But now bees are on decline, which is largely driven by the loss and poisoning of their habitats, something associated with the expansion of industrial agriculture, which is currently concentrated in the tropics. In these regions, the most common production systems are traditional small-scale farms, where campesinas like Maribel enjoy keeping a high diversity of animals and plants, including coffee, cacao, or passion fruits plants benefited by animal pollination that are consumed locally and now largely exported to affluent countries where the demand for healthy and nutritious food is increasing. The persistence of traditional diversified systems is also threatened by agricultural intensification. This is ironic given that smallholders contribute with at least a third of the global food production and represent a viable alternative for the current food system, which as you know, is in crisis. And bee declines arise as a symptom of this crisis. They have co raised concerns to understand the ecological, economic and nutritional implications of animal pollination. And most of those assessments involve the northern hemisphere, but we still don't know much about what happens in tropical megadiverse countries like Colombia, or how drivers and consequences of bee declines are enmeshed in ongoing contexts of agrarian and sociocultural change. Recent approaches to support pollinators focus on the systems of life emerging from composite cultural and biological interaction and how they shape landscapes and farming systems with different implications for pollinators. Most approaches to understand these biocultural aspects are now focused on beekeepers as carriers of knowledges and practices that help perpetuate managed bee species, which are less than one percent of all the bee species in the world. But the perpetuation of managed and especially unmanaged bee species, which provide an important and unique contribution to different crops as shown here in pink compared to the contribution of managed honeybees here in green, re requires explorations beyond beekeepers. Farmers at large and small scale and other actors should be included in efforts to understand the multiplicity of human being relationships and the conditions required for their coexistence. Focusing on a municipality in the Colombian Andes, I have evaluated some interconnections between bees, people, landscapes and livelihoods that depart from explorations of the historical trajectories of agrarian change in the region. I have also analyzed the intersections between rural livelihoods and animal pollination and the effects of different habitat factors for bee diversity. Those explorations are inclusive in the sense that they consider different aspects revealing the complexity of bee declines and impacts on people and the bees. However, they are still insufficient for recognizing deep leverage points that could help counteract bee loss. Currently, as an RCC fellow, I aim to dig deeper to better understand how human bee relationships emerge from intimate practices of noticing that shape forms of interbeing rooted in the transforming biocultural memories of this town. In so doing, I aim to consider the different practices, knowledges, and affects of human communities as they engage in transforming farming ontologies. But I also include different paths through which bees are affected by human dynamics and I try to make visible the abilities used by the bees to stay with the travel of ongoing human-driven transformation. As another account for inclusiveness, this approach may contribute to guide reconciliation practices between humans and the bees and to nurture opportunities for coexistence in the tropical countryside. 
In the rest of the talk, I will share main results from previous work, as well as preliminary approaches and reflections on cohabitation practices linking people and the bees. So let me introduce you the place. Anolaima is a small town located on the eastern flank of the Andes Mountains in Colombia, nested in a transition between tropical submontane to dry forest. The municipality is two hours away from Bogota, the capital of the country, and used to be called the fruit capital of Colombia, most likely building its identity with the help of thousands of wild native pollinators like these bees that we have found in the study region. But people in Anolaima don't think this is the fruit capital of Colombia, Colombia anymore. Agricultural profitability has declined considerably and with it the sustainability of livelihoods and landscapes. I will briefly share some aspects that explain this idea held by farmers. Before the Spanish conquest, Panche indigenous groups cohabited this land with numerous creatures and grew crops such as manioc and corn. They also traded honey, most likely extracted from nests of social stingless bees. Spanish conquerors arrived, displaced and dispossessed Panche people from the land, establishing patronage systems. This was accompanied by the simplification of landscapes to pastures and sugarcane plantations, and Spanish people also brought diverse creatures, including the old world honeybee Apis mellifera. After the Colombian independence and plantations of different commodities, patronage regimes started to change significantly in the region after the introduction of coffee in the, in the late 19th century. The U.S. economic crisis collapsed elite coffee economies and together with peasant protests, this precipitated an agrarian reform that gave peasants the right to own the land where they kept growing coffee shaded by native fruit trees and diversified subsistence crops. An international coffee agreement in 1961 stabilized coffee prices and preceded a coffee boom associated with times of prosperity that drove the replacement of native and fruit trees with a simplified diversity of shade trees, along with the exclusion of home gardens for subsistence production, all to grow more coffee. This was the preamble of major changes brought by Green Revolution technologies in the 1970s, which involved agroecological simplification and the progressive poisoning of the land, causing major ecological imbalances such as the proliferation of uncontrollable pests and most likely the death of thousands of bees. This was intercepted by the surprising arrival of the Africanized honeybee to Anolaima and an abrupt change of relationships between people and the bees. The profitability of coffee declined dramatically with the end of the International Coffee Agreement in 1989 and together with agricultural neoliberalization, imports of cheap food and the dislocation of local markets that followed the Colombian armed conflict, local agriculture was severely hit and became monopolized. Losing spaces to sell and negotiate food prices, many farmers stopped trading small volumes of foods produced in their diversified farms and got entangled in agricultural intensification to produce the volumes demanded by modern agricultural markets. All this is associated with the marked land inequality that pervades in Anolaima. Few people own farms larger than 20 hectares and most people access farms with one hectare or less, which sets the scenario for socioeconomic differentiation that influences the type of agricultural activities and landscapes present in the municipality. And the transition from traditional and diversified farming systems, intensive in labor and local knowledge, towards intensive commercial systems to grow cheap foods that have largely affected landscapes, but also the relationships between rural livelihoods and animal pollination in the region. We conducted surveys regarding food production and consumption in Anolaima, and we found that to the right, people with higher access to money typically engaged in commercial agricultural systems managed with synthetic inputs, pastures for cattle ranching or did not grow food at all and kept simplified recreational farms. And to the left, people with less access to money typically maintained coffee agroforests or crops managed without synthetic inputs and spread agricultural risk by maintaining a high diversity of crops. 
Despite regional losses of crop diversity, households grew at least 42 edible plant species across the municipality. 68% of them were benefited by animal pollination, here highlighted in orange. The most popular commercial crop, coffee, is pollinated by bees and is mainly managed without heavy chemical inputs. But sadly, other crops pollinated by bees and with high domestic demand, such as tomatoes, were intensively managed, which included high loads of pesticides. Other animal pollinated crops, such as passion fruits or blackberry, are seldom grown for commercialization in Anolaima, as now inputs typically fail to control pests. Paradoxically, global prices for these crops are increasing following global trends of bee declines. So it could be said that Anolaima is wasting its potential to grow high value animal pollinated crops as it progressively specializes in the production of cheap foods. In terms of food consumption, despite people grew diverse subsistence crops, most of their diets were purchased. As people accessed more money, the diversity of their diets increased, which is what we see here in green. People accessing higher incomes were those who cultivated foods with agrochemicals or did not grow food. In general, people mainly ate foods not benefited by animal pollination, which is what we see to the left. And as people purchased more foods, diets included more foods pollinated by animals, many of which were grown in Anolaima in the past. People in larger households and smaller farms accessed foods benefited by animal pollination mainly when they grew them, otherwise they could not afford them. And as these foods become more expensive with global pollinator declines, traditional households will have less opportunities to purchase them. This happens in a context in which crop diversity is decreasing globally, diets are homogenizing, and this low dietary diversity is associated with malnourishment. Cases of malnutrition in Anolaima could be worsened without access to pollinator-dependent micronutrient production. After assessing the contribution of animal pollination, for rural livelihoods, we saw these extremes of local farming systems entail different strategies to grow and access food. They also have different footprints on the land and impacts for the bees. Let's see some main results in this realm. We conducted bee surveys in 17 farms with heterogeneous land uses. In terms of local patterns, to the right, we see the different land use types we sampled. The relative length of each color in the bar represents the relative abundance of each land use in the survey. For example, we sampled a lot of pastures in olive green and unshaded traditional crops in yellow. Now you see the relative abundance of different groups. To the left, we have social, species, and what I have highlighted in red involves 78% of the bee species in the municipality, mainly semi-social and solitary bees. They were practically absent in conventional crops and monocultures with simplified shade, and were mainly present in traditional crop fields and areas surrounding human constructions. In terms of landscape patterns, we found that the Africanized honeybee, Apis mellifera, was hyperabundant in simplified areas, stingless social bees were relatively abundant in different habitats, and semi-social and solitary bees were rare and present mainly in complex landscapes. In general, our results suggested a process of biotic homogenization with the loss of some species and the spread of others, especially in areas concentrating simplified fields. I briefly showed that the effects of different land use types on habitats and landscapes are connected through the bees. Our results also suggest that by growing diversified crops with traditional practices, farmers are promoting the presence of bees that pollinate the foods upon which they depend for accessing important micronutrients. But despite growers' practices, pollinators may decline on their farms as they are increasingly surrounded by fields utilizing heavy loads of agrochemicals. In what could be a case of food injustice, Pollinator declines may disproportionately impact the food and nutritional security of traditional households. But in the meantime, people in these systems seem to foster a virtual cycle that could hold the potential of resurgence of the region as a fruit-producing territory. 
Perhaps we can find some cues about such virtuosity by looking at some encounters between people and the bees, and some lessons to stay in the trouble of living together in times of increasing global change. As I briefly mentioned before, in Anulaima there are several bee species. Only few are acknowledged by people in the region, which is understandable as these bees are very difficult to see when they fly around crops and forests. The most salient bee species for local people is Apis mellifera, the common royal honey bee. And decades ago, when the National Coffee Federation promoted beekeeping, many coffee growers became close friends with these bees and invited them to their homes. The Africanization of Apis mellifera in the 80s was associated with many fatal accidents affecting people and their significant others, such as relatives, friends, horses, poultry, cows. Many of those memories persist in the region, and while they have not totally replaced the good memories people had about the bees, many farmers prefer to be far away from any bee and their keepers. So most of the time when people find nests of Apis bees, they burn the nest, or if the bees are lucky, people call beekeepers who rescued a nest, set it in human-made boxes and place them in safe areas where the bees can find food. Most of the times the best places are coffee agroforests. In these systems, many native wild bees, solitary and social, also establish their homes. Stingless social bees are also acknowledged and abundant in Anolaima. Around seven years ago, people started keeping these bees in human-made hives. One of the local precursors was Reinaldo, heir of a beekeeping family. He discovered stingless bee nest entrances all over the place and started setting boxes impregnated with honey and lemongrass with his uncle to call the bees. He did not know how to keep them, so he found YouTube tutorials to make rational boxes or hives. He did not know local names, so he started calling singless bees by the names used in the tutorials. And with his brother, he established a beautiful meliponary. As Reinaldo learned to keep these bees, he lost several nests to parasites. The brothers didn't know who the parasites were, but they kept some that were later determined as for it flies and lemon parasite bees. Reinaldo did not know what to do and he resolved that the best way to go was to help the bees help themselves. He put a door on the hole that served as nest entrance, which according to him was effective and was accepted by the bees. Some boxes that were left empty due to parasite invasions were unexpectedly occupied soon after, like this one colonized by Frisomelita bees. These bees are known for living only in undisturbed and complex environments. Reinaldo mentioned that another empty box was later colonized by Ioglossa orchid bees and that he found a bee cocoon in a pocket of some old pants. Bees, social and solitary, seem to respond to the hospitality of their humans by acknowledging this farm as a refuge in which they, bees, can nest and find food. This response is of great importance because one of the major threats for the bees is the loss of their nesting sites. Agroindustrial expansion is destroying bee nests and as bees leave, other creatures are gone too. In these simplified and poisoned fields, it gets difficult for, for people to run into other creatures and it is easy to forget about the existence of other beings that regularly co-inhabit crop fields and that used to be collaborators. Then, it is also easy to think otherness is harmful, so former allies become enemies that need to be eradicated, something that in these systems is easy to do with chemical weapons. The habit to simplify reinforces simplified habitats and fearful inhabitants. But fortunately, there still remain places where people are used to and even praise otherness. In those places, it is easy to see bees looking for food and nest. Although we still don't understand much the nesting ecology of bees, we do know that this aspect of bee life is pretty important because bees, like us humans, spend an important part of their lives in their shelters. Bees lay eggs, mature and hatch, and later, later process food bounties for themselves and future generations in the nest. And they do that in very diverse places. 
in the ground, cavities, or in exposed areas depending on the species. Sometimes opportunistically establishing their nests in nests of termites, birds, or ants, and developing strategies to get to know and better relate with their insects, co-inhabitants, and other creatures, which involve continuous vigilance of their homes and bounties, or defensive behaviors from beings disturbing their homes. Sometimes bees put this defensive behavior to the service of termites and ants. The flexibility of the bees to explore novel places and to live with other creatures can be vital abilities to respond to change and overcome the large reduction of nesting sites. Novel places now include the material skeleton of human homes, which are stable and free of poisons. Stingless social bees, generally conspicuous, inadvertently occupy electricity outlets, speakers, walls and floors, which can be areas that inevitably provoke reactions in their human hosts. The most common human answer is to respect and even protect the nests from the rain or other threats. Actually, some people were really proud of their guests. Although sometimes stingless bees nest in high-risk areas, where humans consider them undesired difference and try to eradicate them. This mainly affects those bees with defensive behavior. But in places where farmers appreciate the company of others, even defensive bees are respected and welcome. The Spartamona bees took over an old ranchito in Don Luis Jairo's farm. The ranchito was close to the coffee crop. Don Luis Jairo said he knew the bees were working hard on his crop, so letting them stay was the least he could do. Respect is extended to other creatures, even unknown, especially if they have not harmed humans. Don Fernando was concerned about wasps that could tear this wall down, but he left the wall and the creatures alone. It turned out they were not beautiful wasps, but beautiful bees. We found five bee species, including oil collecting bees like this one, three leaf cutter bee species, and we even found a parasite of these sentry bees. Solitary and semi-social bees have also established their nests in human kitchens, stereos, pieces of goods, in the roofs, and many other areas within human homes, including bathrooms. Once humans find out who their guests are, they get surprised and excited. Biologists consider many of these nests are difficult to find, so farmers can be important allies to get to know these bees better. It may not be surprising to see that farmers' homes host so many creatures or that bees choose to live in those places. Those farms tend to be lands of plenty in which people appreciate living with others. Although they know they cannot keep close track of all of their companions, their senses are tuned by curiosity and they are always observing details. For them, the farm is not pristine, it is fluid, so others are observed when possible, left alone when necessary, and managed or eaten when the time comes. And they tend to know their farms by heart. In a small agroforest that could be a living botanical collection, Don Antonio took me to this hidden and abandoned nest of Oxytrigonas. He observed when the nest was active, left the nest alone, so the nest had been invaded by ants, and when I asked again, he had used it to fertilize a plant. Farmers know the abundance of their land is not the result of sole human action. They know everyone has a function, even if they don't know what the function is, so therefore they just try to be as respectful as they can. And when they know about others, they engage in relationships of reciprocity. Elders and young people in these farms had particular ways of experiencing the world, building knowledge, and caring about others. Their practices were based on repeated observations, not taken in isolation of the rest of reality. Farmers never saw a bee by itself. They were always thinking about the world of the bee. The taste of their honey, their natural enemies, the flowers they visited, the surrounding landscape, the major who did not invest in the countryside, the feelings they had when a relative, the Africanized honeybee, stung them once. They can see it all at once. Their capacity to acknowledge complexity and interdependence was impressive. 
And inspiring and touching was to know that despite being marginalized and having many things against, they did not fall in bitterness and constant dissatisfaction. On the contrary, their character was always rooted in radical generosity, in sharing. Sharing knowledge and honey with curious and interested visitors, sharing fruits, hugs, memories, sharing the joy of tranquility in the countryside which came from delighting in others' well-being. This joy took a special place in the relationships farmers engaged with all the creatures that co-inhabited their land, people's main company in times in which El Campo se está quedando solo. This joy, enacted as respect and care, may be what enables traditional smallholders to perpetuate dignified forms of coexistence with the bees, birds, and most other creatures in their farms. Joy was at the heart of their politics, of their making of a desired social order, based on the continuous acknowledgement and respect of otherness as a statement towards coexistence. In these diverse systems of life, in which smallholders are participants and generous stewards, bees are free to deploy their own abilities to respond to change and keep co-producing worlds of abundance with farmers. Those worlds are among the ones we could help revitalize. So to summarize, we can say that the declines in Anolaima arise from complex multi-scale dynamics influencing agricultural trajectories in this region. Such dynamics involve the creation and perpetuation of social inequality, different waves of land use change, random events such as the arrival and then the Africanization of the honeybee and the unraveling of local food markets, all impacting local livelihoods and landscapes and the identity of Anolaima as the fruit capital of Colombia. The progressive simplification of land uses and the transformation of human habits have negatively impacted bees, which are highly sensitive to local processes in this region. But in the meantime, bees refuge in low-impact agroforests and diversified farming systems, which represent a viable ecological and economic alternative for food production. These systems are increasingly vulnerable to sustained local inequality, a rather violent invisibilization, and potentially to pollinator declines. But people there persist through radical forms of resistance or re-existence based in the acknowledgement of interdependence with the co-inhabitants of their land, which is enacted as care, reciprocity, and joy. Pursuing these dignified forms of Coexistence may hold the secret to regenerative and abundant worlds where humans and bees can thrive. <laughs> Thank you all for listening to the bees, for being a source of inspiration, all the people I shared with in Anolaima, and all of the funding agencies that supported this work. Thank you.